just like to give a very quick update on some of the Triple GI activity around 6IMDC and CENA last month in Boston. So I will hand it over to Ingrid Giskies, uh, chair of the Triple GI steering group, to give a quick update on the 6th International Marine Debris Conference. Thanks so much, Joel, and welcome everyone to the webinar today. It's great. Great to see so many of you attending again. Um, so just wanted to take a few minutes to highlight uh, the 6th International Marine Debris Conference, where we had a lot of our global ghost gear initiatives participants attending um, to both elevate the issue of ghost gear and also highlight the fantastic work that's happening around ghost gear all around the world. Um, we did a lot of work um, at 6 a.m. DC. We had a full track on derelict fishing gear, more than 10 sessions a number of poster presentations as well as a few round tables but obviously we also had some time to catch up with Jack Johnson as you can see there in the photo on the right hand side and um, the Triple GI also hosted a drinks event on the Thursday evening where we welcomed some new participants uh, to the Triple GI as well as uh, forged some new connections with existing participants there's a lot of networking opportunities, new connections made, a conversation with governments as well as multilaterals to be had. And I think we all agreed that it was a very uh, successful conference and it almost felt like a, a mini reunion or a mini annual meeting of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative there. Um, and last but not least, we also launched the Global Ghost Gear Gear Reporter app at the conference, uh, which is something that the Build Evidence Working Group has been working on for the last two years. Um, and received a lot of interest of uh, new organizations wanting to join or uh, forging a new data partnership with us, sharing their data on Ghost Gear. Um, so all in all, a really successful conference um, and wonderful to see so many familiar and new uh, faces at the conference. Um, and we've been reassured that the next one will happen in the next two or three years time so that we don't have to wait another seven years uh, for such a fantastic event. Great, thanks Ingrid. Um, and I'll just give a very quick update on the Seafood Expo North America in Boston, which was happening at the same time. Um, so while everyone else was in uh, San Diego in the sun, um, Martin and I were in Boston, in Boston in a blizzard. Um, one of the best uh, updates from uh, Seafood Expo North America, uh, very exciting news is that Thai Union, one of the world's largest seafood companies has officially joined the Triple GI. Um, they we're really excited about this. Um, and Thai Union is also very excited about this. Uh, it was a great meeting. Um, we had a press conference that went well uh, as well to, to release the news. CBC did a TV spot interviewing uh, myself and Darian McBain, the Global Director of Sustainable Development, who you can see in the photograph to the right. Um, this is really good news for the fishing industry and really good news for the Triple GI. We're hoping that uh, other uh, fishing companies will uh, follow Thai Union's lead and see the benefit of joining Triple GI uh, and making a positive contribution to this issue. Uh, we also had some very promising meetings with some major corporates um, as well as some other major seafood companies. Um, so we're, we're well on our way to uh, um, elevating this issue within the seafood community and uh, making sure that we get some, uh, some increasing support from the seafood uh, industry. So I think I'll keep it to that. And um, Martin, are you ready for your presentation? Yeah. Okay, yes. then I will hand it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Joel. And thank you for the opportunity to present. So what I'm going to do in, in 10 minutes um, is to just give a quick overview of a few resources that have evolved from particularly our activities within Circular Ocean, uh, because some of you may not be aware of that. Circular Ocean is, is, is a project really, and I think some of you may have heard me present at a previous one, really focused on a lot of the issues to do with waste fishing nets and ropes uh, and components and particularly looking at the recycling uh, and uh, opportunities related to innovation and, and products. And, and our background is we've done a lot of work, particularly with uh, SMEs um, in, in this, this area that we've brought to the project. And particularly this project is focused on the northern periphery region. So, so basically, we've been really trying to uh, look at a lot of issues to do with the, the, the what I term opportunities. Um, for, for the, the nets, ropes and components. There is a general circular ocean website, but what we've also built is a specific section on our, our website. If you can uh, see at the top there, um, we, we, we have a variety of projects and we've, we've built a specific section here on the outputs from this particular project. And our uh, focus within the project is very much on the innovation, the products, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
we've got uh, background resource material on an event we ran in Iceland, uh, details of, of, of uh, webinars we're running, something called the NetHack Challenge uh, uh, that, that is an innovation workshop uh, that I'll come back to very briefly, a series of game uh, process that we ran in various ports, various uh, reports and videos. So I'll just skim through that very quickly. If you're interested in more, um, please go to the to the link there. So particularly, uh, we're we're running once a month up to September a webinar series, uh, about one hour, um, really around eco innovation um, uh, of uh, you know really particularly for startups and SMEs on uh, the sort of issues you need to consider if you've got a concept for a, a product or a service or a new business model from nets ropes of components and the sorts of issues. Uh, that you might want to think about from marketing through R&D to, to crowdfunding, et cetera. Whilst we're particularly focused on the northern periphery region, we're not turning people away at the door. So interestingly, uh, we're having people join the webinar, uh, you know, globally. So uh, please feel free. It's free. You just need to sign up uh, and, and send us an email. If you miss next Monday, when the next month is, we'll be running them you know, monthly up to September. So uh, feedback seems to be quite positive. And this this particular webinar is based, uh, a lot of the content is based on a downloadable uh, report that we've uh, produced. If you think back to the, the front page of the website, we've got a section called reports. That takes you to a section on our website that lists all of the various reports we produce as part of the center as activities. So we have a series of uh, reports particularly related to uh, this particular project. So we have have got one pro um, report that we've just uh, published that lists all the products that we've been able to find um, that, are, that are using uh, uh, nets, ropes and components. So that's again freely do downloadable. Uh, we, we're interested to hear things we've missed out. We know there's a few things but this is uh, hopefully quite well organized and it's a one place where you can see the different products. As I mentioned here, we also produce this free booklet uh, around eco innovation for startups, you know, in this particular area. We also did uh, a, a feasibility study uh, looking at, you know, the issues on the ground in ports related to the nets and ropes, um, you know, and you've got the, the challenges over you know, uh, the complexity of the legislation, uh, different approaches in different countries to the recycling and waste management. Uh, so that, that, that again is freely downloadable. What we've also got that I couldn't fit into the slide is some work we did on 3D printing and fishing nets and ropes and components that again is, is there plus a PowerPoint presentation. As I mentioned, we, we pioneered this uh, uh, hackathon approach with nets and ropes. Uh, we've run three of these and uh, this is a, a group based process where people go through a series of creative processes to come up with new ideas using the nets, ropes and components. Then they get the nets uh, physically developed and then they develop concepts. What we've done is open source the concepts that have evolved from the three workshops um, with the hope that um, collaborators might work with the design teams to take some of those ideas forward. So again, you can find all of the products that will come out of the sessions available uh, from uh, by clicking through the, the NetHack Challenge website. This is just one example of one product called Rainbow Panels that was a, a display panel idea uh, that came up with, they came up with one from one team. So, you know, use, you can see there potentially using the nets. This might be something that you could sort of put up in a room, you know, to, to hang various things from, you know, add uh, notes and things like that. But there's a, there's a whole variety of diff different concepts that have been open source there. And really we're looking, you know, any interest to take any of those ideas forward. Ideally, obviously, you know, collaborating with the existing design teams as part of sort of open innovation approach. So what we're just about to launch is a circular uh, ocean innovation competition. Uh, uh, the goal is um, technical, technical issues and website aside is to launch this next week um, and this will run through until June. And again, this is a, a, a competition open to anyone in the world um, to come up with ideas uh, and solutions to 
uh, 15 challenges that we've categorized under 14 uh, under four categories so these are these are both product market concepts you reusing the next roads and components as well as process issues particularly with recycling the key issue there I, I guess is that those I those concepts and ideas need to be relevant for the northern periphery area so nothing you know that that's designed for sort of tropical you know zones for example uh, and there'll be also two awards one for under 25s and one for over 25s but we'll circulate this and and Joel as as uh, and uh, has agreed to be uh, one of the judges, and we're going to collaborate with GGI on, on this. Um, so you'll hear something soon, the next few weeks on this. Just in closing here, uh, one of our final deliverables um, that we will produce is um, a, uh, a, a piece of work looking at the idea of a circular economy lab using nets, nets and ropes. And we're using lab very uh, broadly here. So this might be a physical place in a port or coastal area whereby people come together to develop products um, from nets and ropes, either reuse products. It might be uh, 3D printing product products using filaments from 3D printing or using uh, pellets in, uh, you know, uh, from the nets and ropes for injection molding. So what we're doing really is, um, you know, look at the idea of an innovation system in port areas and uh, what we're going to do is open source the blueprint, uh, uh, you know, around the idea of what a, a circular lab related to the nets and ropes might look like. It won't be a definitive th thing, but it will be something that if in, people are interested in looking at this further, will give you uh, some starting points and thoughts to, 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 to make people, th you know, to help people think in, in the right direction. I think we're on to now questions. So yes, any questions? Hopefully I was within my time there, Jobs. You were perfect, thanks, Martin. Anybody have any questions for Martin? I can't say I've had the pleasure of attending one of those webinars uh, that Martin referred to, and it's extremely useful information. So I would highly encourage anybody interested, um, even if you're not in the Northern Arctic periphery region, um, it's, still, uh, it's still some great information and a uh, great webinar. And, and if anybody doesn't want to speak over the uh, the line, you know, I'm happy to pick up queries as long as they're short, sharp emails and not pages. Okay. Well, um, that's that's great. Um, thank you very much, Martin. Um, always great to hear what's going on at Circular Ocean. And um, again, if anybody, um, I highly encourage people to to um, have a look and join the webinar if you can. Um, great and great work being done over there. So thanks, Martin, and um, I think I will hand it off now to Stephen Tapp from Local Independent Sea Anglers. Thank you, Joel. Um, good day, everybody. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit about Lisa and uh, our journey so far with the GGI. Okay, so we are a community-based organization, around about 400 members, and there's a couple of shots of things that we do, fishing meets, uh, conservation, education with young anglers, etc. Important to say that we're a not-for-profit organization, um, purely funded by our volunteers uh, that run everything. So we do safety advice on local uh, venues, uh, innovative approach to conservation education with, uh, they are um, stencils, real size stencils of the conservation size of fish. And yes, we do run the World Squid Championships and of course, line recycling. So uh, one of the things that Lisa started out originally was doing beach cleans and that's where the line recycling actually came from. When we were doing the recycling, uh, sorry, when we were doing the beach cleans, obviously a lot of items could be recycled. Uh, fishing line, fortunately, pleasantly, was less than 5%, but it started the conversation. It was then that we realized that uh, most uh, line that's used, waste if you like, uh, is generated in the home. So this is the eye opener, the hard facts. Uh, this is a conservative estimate. Um, I think we're pretty good on the uh, amount of regular anglers, but I think we're rather light on the amount of line that they consume. But if we just take that figure of 200 linear meters of line a year, that would reach to the moon. The chilling fact is if you put it in landfill, certainly heavier monofilament will take up to 600 years to degrade. So that is no longer an option. So how did we come to meet Harry? Well, he was on BBC TV talking about the GGI. 
Um, he mentioned nylon gill nets. We've been talking about recycling monofilament line and I got in touch with him via MCB. Uh, we had coffee and we started from there. So Lisa members uh, funded uh, the start of the operation with bins, uh, printing the stickers. Um, we use social media a great deal to promote the scheme. Uh, kept meeting with Harry and we wrote a brief for a national scheme. Just an example there of some of the uh, our website, for example, a couple of the uh, Facebook pages that um, we use, and that's the Sussex IFCA, the Inshore Fisheries um, uh, Authority, uh, who we uh, piggyback on their website and their Facebook page as well. In terms of reach, uh, with our affiliate Facebookers, uh, with Lisa and the other angling organisations, we can hit at least 10,000 anglers uh, with one post, uh, which is excellent. Uh, so, Lisa from the GGI, obviously Harry Owen was uh, key in bringing us together. So it was the marine element uh, that brought us to the GGI, um, but when we actually uncovered the scale uh, of the amount of monofilament line consumed, uh, Joel very generously recognised the environmental impact overall, and we signed up in October 2017. So, uh, the brief that we wrote, we talked to quite a few people, it has to be easy has to be easy to return, so we've been working on that. Uh, we would need the support of the tackle trade, both with the retailers and the shops themselves, and of course the anglers. So uh, a survey was commissioned to establish anglers' attitudes to recycling, and uh, the GGI commissioned it, and we are promoting it via social media, etc., in the UK. So we are a sea angling organisation, but there are Numerous other activities that involve anglers, i.e. freshwater fishing, boat fishing and lure anglers. So recognising that um, there was a wider audience, uh, Lisa uh, members have um, created a new national identity to cover all aspects of the sport. So the Anglers National Line Recycling Scheme um, is launched now, it's up and running and it will retain uh, both Lisa and GGI branding. So this is a, just a shot of uh, the survey page. Um, it's got a nice link through to SurveyMonkey. Uh, and what we do is we pop that on all the posts that we've put out in social media. And uh, we get people to uh, hopefully follow that through and do the survey. Uh, I think the numbers were up to 575 last time I spoke to Joel. And our target is 1,000 by the end of April. That will give us some very realistic data to go to the industry and anglers to show them how important it is. So just an overview of the sort of questions. We want to know what type of angler they were, freshwater sea, how many reels they own. Um, we've worked on an assumption that there are two. Um, for example, I have six. So my consumption is considerably more than 200 uh, metres a year. Uh, current disposal method, frankly, is landfill. Uh, people do put it in their plastic recycling, but the councils sort it out and put it to landfill. So obviously it's a preferred route to recycle. And what we try to establish is how much line is generated and how far people would be prepared to go to deposit it so that we can recycle it. So using the survey data, um, we can put together a very good picture of um, the actual volumes of line. Um, that in turn, we hope will attract an end user. Um, so that we can come up with a uh, uh, recycled product. Uh, the preferred method of return may be post, it may be uh, taking it to stores. Um, how costs might be mitigated, in other words, would anglers be prepared to pay a few more pence for items to cover the cost of the scheme? Um, and uh, we will move on to establish a, a full national recycling network. So progress report, so um, 15 kilos of used line from just eight shops this year, so that's only three and a half months. Um, that's an estimated 81 miles of line or Brighton to Oxford. So it is a considerable uh, volume. These bags were loaded onto a lorry early yesterday when I met with Harry uh, in the port of Shoreham and also helped him load a lot of uh, nets as well. So a project update here. So the final results will enable the conversation with the tackle trade. We have um, informally been having co conversations with some major brands. The, the, the names on the slide may not mean a great deal to uh, you guys, but Linear Fisheries, uh, they run a big chain of um, gravel extraction, uh, create lakes and create fisheries. I think they've got about 37,000 members. Nash, uh, which would encode our big uh, names in the industry over here. And they have already offered to support the scheme, uh, including printing costs, stationery and uh, logistics, i.e. getting the line to a central point. 
so uh, we attended a, a trade conference or trade do uh, tackle fair a couple of weeks ago and as a result of that and some networking Viv Shears one of our good guys uh, secured 10 minutes on national radio uh, with Fisherman's Blues to launch the national line uh, scheme uh, since the radio program and since we launched uh, Angler's National Line Recycling Scheme, we have now doubled the amount of shops taking part in the UK to over 50. OK, so this is just the wind up one at the end. So this is the future goals. It's quite a challenge we've set ourselves, but we're confident that with the resources at our disposal and uh, with the GGI behind us, uh, we can actually build this into something that's going to work a treat. Um, we're going to work with fisheries, dive groups and other beach clean organisations. Uh, we've got plans for two on-site bins on local venues, Brighton Marina and Shoreham Arm. We want to look and come up with a product that can engage anglers that is made from the recycled line. Uh, we want to develop partnerships uh, for, to achieve those aims. Cost neutral is the target, so we'd like to raise some revenue uh, from the recycled product that would at least maybe cover the cost of postage return. But if it were to turn any profit, then we would... Um, like to put that back into the scheme that's an aspiration and the little picture of the pebble which i thought i'd put on uh, uh, have a good day we actually found that sitting on the shingle uh, when we were doing a beach clean at cookmere haven in sussex uh, so that's uh, where we were uh, how we got there and where we're going hope you found it interesting and, and uh, look forward to working with joel and the ghost skier uh, for some years to come thank you Thank you very much, Stephen. You were bang on 10 minutes. That was uh, pretty impressive. Um, uh, yeah. It had been in rehearsed, Joel. It had been rehearsed. <laughs> well, <laughs> it certainly showed. Um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions for uh, for Steve? Hi, Joel. It's Lynn. Hi, Lynn. I just wanted to say it's really great to see a, a group that's um, um, part of the recreational fishery. Um, I'm joining up to the Triple GI. Um, I think it might be our first recreational fishery organization. Is that right? It is, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, um, something that has been not as well explored, um, the recreational side of things. But as uh, some of the stats that uh, Steve put out there show that it definitely <laughs> does have an impact. And there's a lot of anglers out there. So uh, bear yeah, in mind, that's, ju that's just the UK. You know, yeah. if you include... That, you know, European anglers, uh, New Zealand, Australia. I mean, you're talking mega volumes, John, mega volumes. Yeah. And yeah. Steve, how big is your organization um, relative to um, other recreational fishing organizations, say, in the UK? Uh, so we have just under 400 members, which would be double the average size of an angling club, for example. Um, but some of the associations we work with or are affiliated to, they have several thousand members. Not all of them are active, um, and a lot of the work is done by a few of the people in Lisa. Uh, but um, we're a modest sized organisation. We've doubled in size in the last two years. So we're looking to go towards a thousand members over time. Um, and all of those will be disciples out there uh, spreading the word and collecting the line, etc. So it's growth. Mm -hmm. um, Joel, it's, it's Ingrid here. I think I, I definitely echoes Lynn and Lynn's enthusiasm um, to have a recreational fishing organisation join the initiative. And I was just wondering, maybe it could be interesting to write up a short case study of the work that you've been doing to date to share with other countries as well. I'm based here in Australia and fishing is huge here as well. And I'm sure that um, if we have a bit of a case study of what a recreational fishing organization, what kind of role they can play and all the different activities that you guys have been doing that might be quite inspirational um, and motivate, motivating for other um, organizations to come on board as well. So I was thinking maybe a short case study um, and a copy of some of your survey results in a more like synthesized way um, that could be shared globally uh, could be quite good to get more um, recreational fishing organizations on board. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I, we're going to run the survey till the end of April um, and then there'll be a, a period of time, obviously, when it'll, all, all the numbers have to be crunched and the, and the figures will come out. I think that the PowerPoint that uh, Joel has um, shown today, I mean, that might be a starting point uh, for you in Australia to say, look at Lisa over in the UK, um, the things that we're doing. Um, and maybe that would, you know, kickstart Lisa Australia. <laughs> 
Sounds very promising. Thank you. <laughs> Australasia. <laughs> there you go. And so, yeah, Steve, you and I can talk about that offline. Once we have the survey results, it might be good to incorporate the results from the survey into the uh, into a potential PowerPoint that we could share with other with other uh, regions. Yeah, perfect. Yep, yeah, yep yeah, for that. Perfect. Hey, Joel, this is Anne Marie. Um, if you want, if you're interested in, I'm working with a couple of uh, local BC recreational fishing organizations on a panel that I'm on. So. Um, if you get some information, happy to do an introduction if you wanted to speak with them. Yeah, I think that would be that would be terrific. And uh, the timing yeah. might, work, might work out really well too, um, closer towards the end of April once we've got this information together. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that would be great to start spreading the word about, about this. Okay. Thanks. I've got a meeting at the end of April with them, so um, okay. I can mention it. Sure, that would be lovely. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. If you want to contact me, get you know, obviously uh, Joel can put me in touch. I'm happy to take emails, etc. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Steve. Really appreciate it. And I think what we'll do now is uh, hand over to Holly Kohler. Great. Thank you, Joel. My and, pleasure. And what, thank you for letting us uh, be part of the webinar today. Um, I wanted to give you this uh, brief introduction to ISSF also, and for those of you that may not be uh, familiar with the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. ISSF was launched in 2009 by scientists, leaders in the industry, and environmental champions. And the purpose of launching ISSF was based on the shared concerns of those uh, stakeholders about the future of tuna fisheries and the desire to do something about it collaboratively. The ISSF mission is to undertake and facilitate science-based initiatives for the long-term conservation and sustainable use of global tuna stocks, reducing bycatch and pr promoting tuna ecosystem health. Uh, you can learn a lot more about all the work that ISSF does and um, some of the, uh, much in much more detail on our website. So I won't go into all of that now, but I wanted to make two important points about ISSF. Um, the first thing is that science is our guide. And um, so what that means is that research and science underpins um, all of the work that we do. So all of the conservation measures that we adopt, all of the research, all of the uh, pu uh, public facing advocacy and outreach work that we do, that science undermines, uh, underlines all of that. And um, more than 70% of our budget goes towards original collaborative research uh, by leading marine scientists across a wide range of fields. And that research and science, and some of which I will be talking about today, leads to policies and practice that promote better fisheries management. So that's really the, the core of what ISSF does is, is, is science, um, collaborative science research, and then taking that science and research and using it to drive improvements both on the water with fish, tuna fishing vessels in collaboration with fleets and industry and then at the international stage through the regional fisheries management organizations to promote and advocate for better fisheries management. And the second um, important point I wanted to make about ISSF is that we are a highly collaborative organization. Um, with Through our work and um, through our stakeholders, many voices speak. So we believe strongly that our success is based on the diversity of our stakeholders. And so that means that we work uh, in, in great, in great, very closely with scientists, other NGOs, governments and foundations, as well as the fishing, processing, retail and food service companies. And we, we really value that diversity and we value that collaboration. And we believe that that is, um, one of our strengths, that we are essentially a, a unique partnership that unites a long-term vision of conservation with a business-like concern for accountability and results. So I wanted to give that quick introduction to ISSF for those of you that weren't familiar. I know some uh, do work with ISSF that are a part of GGI, and so that, and then we're very uh, grateful to see that, that they're getting involved in this, this initiative. So I'm going to speak about today, um, ISSF is involved in a, a lot of work related to fats, uh, and I'll touch on sort of a sample of that work at the very end, but, but today what I'm going to do is focusing on two things, our work related to non-entangling fats and biodegradable fats. 
Uh, for those of you that may not know what a FAD is, it's an acronym for fishery, fishing aggregate, fisheries aggregation device. And what that is, is a raft uh, that is constructed. It's a man-made device um, that is placed in the ocean that uh, attracts tuna. Um, that's what most um, people are familiar with are, are FADs, um, are, are the man-made or person-made uh, devices. But um, tuna fisheries also can set on uh, other floating objects in the ocean that are naturally produced, such as logs uh, or dead animals or other types of naturally produced um, uh, floating objects which would attract tuna and that's um, and that's a way that fishermen find schools of tuna and uh, set on them but I'm going to be speaking today only about those that are created by humans and placed in the ocean in order to serve as attraction points for tuna to meet for for harvesting of tuna this ISSF's position on FADs and, the, and, the, and that what underlines all of our work is that is the again as I noted in the beginning is we're science-based and so our position is that, that fishing aggregation devices are not inherently bad based on research and data. However, they are, uh, are not going away. They are part of a, an active fishing gear that is used uh, globally, but that means they need to be managed. And we believe that all fishing gear needs to be managed holistically and based on science. And so one of the things that we've been spending a lot of energy on and a lot of advocacy and a lot of scientific research is building and better managing a FAD so that we um, can address some of the impacts of FADs on the ecosystem, as well as ensure that as a fishing gear, they are proper, properly and scientifically managed. And as I noted earlier, collaboration is essential for this. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some ongoing research that we're doing in ISS stuff that we're supporting in, in related to biodegradable materials. So in the Indian Ocean, we've been actively engaged with the Maldives and the International Pole and Line Foundation to conduct controlled tests on anchored fads. Those tests uh, were to look at how three materials, cotton, cotton plus, plus sisal and cotton plus sisal plus linen, um, how those would function in a fad and how long they would last over time. So basically what we're doing here is replacing the plastic um, or nylon netting that is hangs below the fad that is part of the, sub, the submerged structure around which tuna would aggregate, replacing that with these different types of materials and then examining their breaking strength and how long they last in the environment. Based on this research, um, the scientists concluded that 100% cotton rope worked the best. It lacks, lasts as long as fishermen want. It's flexible, it's easy to handle and on board, and it has a lower manufacturing cost. We've also been um, testing in the Indian Ocean in collaboration with the Spanish fleet, uh, tests on biodegradable fads um, at sea. So the first slide was about anchored fads. These would be uh, at sea tests of um, drifting fads. And here looking also at the submerged structure. And you'll see there in the, in the photo, there's an example of use, how to create the submerged appendage of the fat, but using these, uh, nil uh, instead of using nylon or plastic, using the uh, ropes. So 174 fads total were deployed and examined in this study last year. 85 were the biodegradable types, and those were then compared against 89 traditional ones. The preliminary conclusions from this study is that the biodegradable fads are as effective as non-biodegradable fads in aggregating tuna. Because that's always one of the concerns uh, in, in, with, with industry and in terms of changing gear types is will it have a, an economic impact on their ability to catch uh, the fish or the, 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 the resource that they're, they're after. So this is a very positive preliminary conclusion uh, regarding uh, based on these, these tests that we have been supporting. Also would note that the fleet that is, has been involved as a, as a partner in this research that's been testing these materials have actually now started using biodegradable cotton ropes in their fads. So they've actually taken that extra step to, to, to build on this research and actually use it in practice, even though they're not being required to do so. There is all, 
right now no alternative for the flotation part of the raft, so the piece that sits on the surface of the ocean. We've been looking at the submerged structure because that's where um, you can have uh, the plastics uh, disengaging and becoming lost into the environment or getting uh, uh, entangled in uh, either the, uh, the ecosystem, like on a coral reef or something, or other types of um, parts of the environment, or entangling uh, species that you're not intending. And I will talk about that piece in a moment. But right now, there's not an alternative for that flotation part. But um, the use of fads with that structure, main hanging structure of cotton or other natural materials, would be an important step towards minimizing impacts of beaching events or sinking events. And the research from these two slides are going to be helping are helping to guide a project we're engaged in this year, which is a large scale project in the Indian Ocean that's partially funded by the European Union, ISSF, and the fishing fleets, and in the Atlantic with Ghana and the fleets in Ghana, which is part of an FAO Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction project. So this research that we've done last year is now carrying forward into these two other large scale projects that we are in, involved with in two oceans, in the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. So as I mentioned there, you know, you have the biodegradable piece I mean, you have um, the, the fad uh, breaking down and or getting or getting lost and that can result in uh, marine debris or derelict fishing gear, uh, beaching events and so on. That's one aspect of, of fads that is that ISSF has been working on. The other aspect is the is entanglement. So you have this submerged structure below below the fad uh, before below the raft. And if you're using netting that's of a certain size, that can that's been shown by some studies in the, that were done in the Indian Ocean several years ago that it, that shark there can be a significant uh, number of sharks, particularly silky sharks, that can get entangled in that netting if it's loose and it has a mesh size greater than seven centimeters. So, as a based on this study, ISSF worked with um, researchers, bycatch scientists and fishing gear technologists um, world over to develop a guide for non-entangling fads. And you'll see um, on the slide there, uh, part of that guide. And it provides specific recommendations for on a spectrum of how you can go from the highest risk fad to the lowest risk fad when it comes to um, not only entanglements, but uh, biodegradable uh, materials and how to reduce the impact on the environment should that fad become lost or sink or beach. This guide is available on our website in seven different languages. After developing this guide, ISSF has been engaged in focused outreach to fleets, regional fisheries management organizations, governments, and other stakeholders regarding these designs, working on de developing ways to engage with them and explain uh, why it's important, uh, present the science behind uh, this issue, and how the, the guide and the recommendations in the guide um, uh, should be, you know, provide an alternative to um, using the traditional fads and how the new bio, non, uh, the new uh, non-entangling fads can address these concerns and still function effectively in the per se tuna fishery that where uh, fit it, setting on fads is a major component of that fishery. We've also direct, engaged directly with Persane skippers through workshops where we dialogue directly with skippers, crew, fleet and fleet owners. We've had these skippers workshops since 2009 and they have a global reach. We've reached more than 3,000 skippers, crew, ship owners, fleet managers and others and cannery managers in over 20 countries. Part of that workshop um, is a guidebook that um, ISSF has online in 10 languages and that guidebook includes information on non-entangling fad designs. And those, that, those, um, that guide and the detail on the design of non-entangling fads is presented at these workshops where this dialogue takes place with uh, those that are actually active on the water in, uh, at, a, at a global scale. We've also uh, hosted a workshop with skippers that's specifically on non-entangling fad designs in 2015. And the purpose of this workshop was to 
to work directly with the the vessel owners and the skippers to learn more about how their how their use of these designs is is going if they had some new ideas or some things that were working or not working and we use that to refine the ISSF guide also in 2006 ISSF adopted a conservation measure um, which requires transactions with vessels that use only non-entangling fads. And so what that means is one of the, is that ISSF, the ISSF Foundation adopts conservation measures. And these conservation measures um, are, are implemented by those participating companies that are participants in ISSF. And ISSF currently has about 75% of the tuna processing capacity um, participating in ISSF. And those participating companies implement each of the conservation measures that are adopted by the foundation. And they're audited annually by an independent auditor. And those audit reports are publicly available uh, that shows how well they're implementing each one of those conservation measures that ISSF Foundation has adopted. And it also provides um, information on their efforts to remediate any nonconformances that are found. ISSF and these and the ISSF participating companies have been also engaging in uh, targeted advocacy to RFMOs and through the supply chain to other stakeholders about non-entangling fats. And you can see here, um, we were very excited that last year the WCPFC uh, took the took a step to adopt some provisions relating to uh, recommending the use of non-entangling fats. So that means that now all four of the major tropical tuna regional fisheries management organizations now include either a requirement or a recommendation for the use of non-entangling fads in their first tank fishery. And you can see here on the on the slide on the right hand side right. what we've done here is the the top portion of that slide has um, ha is based on surveys that we've done through our skippers workshops. So it shows how originally in the early days of the skippers workshops when we were talking about non-entangling fads there was not very high acceptance levels. But you can see how those acceptance levels have really grown in the last three or four years. And you can also track that and see when the fleets and the industries uh, were engaged and saw the value of this of these types of changes in their gear technology, you will then saw an increase in action at the regional level and the international level, adopting binding measures across fleets and across regions. So that shows the, the value of engaging the industry and engaging the fleets and getting input from them on, on these designs and seeing it translate into normative change at the international level. So I just wanted to get, this is just a quick sample. As I said, ISSF is engaged in a lot of FAD related work. This is just a sample of our work since 2016, last October of 2016. We do a lot of research um, on biodegradables. We've also been doing research on acoustic discrimination. Uh, so figuring out what which uh, species are under a, under a fad to, to address uh, uh, bycatch issues or, or taking of uh, small fish that may not be the target of that particular fishery. We have a, a lot of publications on a whole range of issues um, related to fads. We've been at very active in making presentations. I mentioned the skippers workshops already. And then of course we have a very active communications um, <clears throat> either through social media or uh, publications and uh, op-eds and other types of things, graphics and so on. And here's just some information about how you can follow ISSF and learn more about what we're doing. And if you wanna be, get our weekly newsletter, you can send an email there to that. Um, just subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you'll get a lot more information on all the work that ISSF is doing on fads and more. And I think that might be it. Great. Thank you very much, Holly. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know it's early for you like it is for me. Um, so I uh, really do appreciate that. Does anyone have any quick questions for Holly before we move on? Uh, I had one really quick question. Um, I haven't looked into ISSF's work in great detail yet, but I was just wondering, um, one of the things that the Global Ghost Gear Initiative has been quite involved with is working together with FAO on the guidelines for the marking of fishing gear. And during the technical consultation, uh, fish aggregating devices obviously were heavily debated as well. So I was wondering if ISSF is doing any work on the marking of fats in addition to the biodegradable uh, work and the non-entangling work that you're doing? 
we're not doing anything independent of the FAO. We are we have been active in that process as well and uh, have provided a lot of detailed comments to, on those guidelines. So we're we're working within the FAO process to to help guide the um, development of those marking guidelines, but we're not doing anything independent of that. And in um and in some of your uh, practical work, are you trialing any of the marking guidelines j just yet, or are you waiting for the the guidance to be adopted in July first? Yeah, we're waiting on that. We're not we're not trialing anything at this time. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for Holly? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, there's some information on how to get in touch if you do uh, have any further questions. Thank you very much for your time again, Holly. Really do appreciate it. And um, and I think we will move on to Leandro. Leandro, uh, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Oh, it, great. the the internet The internet came through for you. It it did come through to, to towards the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, just just to uh, before we start, just to uh, give a small introduction uh, about myself. Um, I I'm not part of any sort of organization or anything. I'm uh, pretty much just a individual who is very passionate about um, you know um, making our oceans and our uh, planet cleaner. And um, so basically, uh, I've been living in Sri Lanka for the last 15 years now. Um, half German, half Italian, but um, I, I basically lived here most of my life, so I do consider myself somewhat Sri Lankan, I guess. Um, so I stumbled upon um, a big issue here in Sri Lanka, which is um, the waste management situation, which uh, has not been looked into for the last, uh, well, until uh, for the last 35 years, actually, um, because of the war, which was which was going on here. So um, that really had a huge impact um, on the waste management in Sri Lanka. Um, so now only people are starting to uh, realize and hear a lot about Sri Lanka and uh, the issues uh, that are arising now. So yeah, I'll um, get straight to it. All right. Um, so basically what I've done is I have set up um, sort of uh, my own little project um, to eradicate discarded fishing nets um, all around the coastal areas. And um, my primary objectives for this project, as you can see here, um, is purchasing uh, the discarded fishing nets from fishermen, uh, which uh, is very interesting because it creates an alternative income for them. Um, the fishermen are also some of the poorest um, communities in the country, so it it works very well to work together with them. Um, then uh, send, sending the discarded nets to recycling factories who turn them into new products who recycle them. Uh, also, one one of the biggest, one of the most important ones as well is uh, education. So educating the poor communities, like I said. Uh, which are mostly fishermen living by the ocean uh, and business owners on waste management. Business owners, again, it's a lot of um, a lot of big hotels, a lot of surf camps. Um, my main focus is on on the coastal areas of Sri Lanka, um, and then uh, of course build awareness, uh, improve the livelihoods and health of poor communities, uh, prevent further pollution to the environment. That's a big one. Um, support and work together with government government organizations. So um, there's very very little support in that in that area. So there are quite a few government organizations um, that are trying their best, but um, it's it's very difficult on that end to find uh, you know the funding and and you know to uh, to really know what what they're doing. So that's also a really big one. Uh, implementing the project in other countries. Uh, once it works out here in Sri Lanka, I'm very keen to look at other developing countries uh, in this region and uh, implement the same project. Another one is uh, improve methods to collect discarded fishing nets, um, meaning logis logistically um, improving the ways of collecting them, um, you know, getting in, that could be getting in touch with um, diving centers, you know, who could organize Underwater cleanups, or um, you know, identifying um, ghost gear, 
And then there's uh, to improve the health of the marine ecosystem by working closely with local and foreign environmentalists, as well as government organizations. And then at the end, also protect all animals. Uh, then we've got the situation. So um, this is this is quite quite interesting here. Um, so this is the, 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 the research that I've been doing for the last uh, four or five months since I started this project. Um, so Sri Lanka tops the list at number five of the worst ocean plastic polluters. Um, we dump, uh, we dump 1.83 million metric tons of plastic, um, fishing nets and other non-organic waste into our oceans each year. Um, now, this is also a main, a big reason for this is lack of education. Um, as I said, Sri Lanka has been through a 35 year war. And um, back in the days, uh, Sri Lankans, they basically used to burn most of their waste and throw it into the ocean. Um, but back in the days uh, there was plastic did not exist here so now plastic does exist unfortunately and um, they're burning tons and tons of plastic and throwing it into the ocean um, not not having a clue on on what it you know how it affects the marine life the ecosystem and their lives as well and um, you know it's one of those things where you know you can't blame them uh, because it's a lack of education um, so then there's also 34% of that, of the 1.83 million metric tons of plastic waste comes from fishing nets. Um, so this is my main focus is to um, focus on the fishing nets and recycling the fishing nets. Um, then uh, demand for fishing nets in Sri Lanka um, are currently more than 4.4 uh, million metric tons a year. That is the current demand. The, the fishing industry in Sri Lanka is growing each year. I think last year uh, it was at 3 million. Um, so now it's jumped up another million, which is not a very um, good sign. Um, and then about all the used nets eventually end up in the ocean or landfills. Um, so there is no recycling system here. Uh, most, most of the nets are collected to be sold uh, to farmers, sorry, there's a typo, um, to farmers um, who cover crop uh, which eventually uh, end up trapping animals and ending up, um, you know, in the farms or, you know, just in, in landfills in the end. So um, the good thing is, the, the good thing about this is that um, the, the locals, they don't just throw away the fishing nets. They have, they have basically realized that they can uh, sell it to uh, these farmers who cover their crop with it. Um, but that is also not a very, uh, you know, that is, that is not very, very good for the environment in the end because it just ends up in, in, uh, it, on farms. Um, they also, which I haven't mentioned here, they also uh, turn the um, used fishing nets into large anchor ropes. Um, and when I asked uh, what happens, you know, what, what happens to these anchor ropes, um, simply, you know, their last life is basically getting stuck uh, at the bottom of the ocean and then they have to cut the anchor rope. So it basically ends up in the ocean. So none of these are really very, uh, uh, very good methods of recycling. Um, so the good, the good side of that is that um, the fishing, the used fishing nets are available. So um, there, there is not much need to, um, you know, go around searching for it because the fishermen actually do the collecting. So I basically have all these collectors everywhere already. Um, it's just a matter of approaching them and, and buying the nets from them in bulk. And, uh, and, and using that to, to be recycled. Um, then um, all the used nets, uh, yeah, I got that one already. Um, then I've got, no one is recycling the nets in Sri Lanka. Like I said, um, approximately 20 tons of used nets uh, can, can be collected every three to four months in the first stages of the project. Now these 20 tons of used nets is just in the two uh, two, three largest towns in the south region of Sri Lanka. Um, there's the east coast, there's the west coast, and there's the, there's the north. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. 
Um, and uh, then I've got there's almost no system in recycling waste in Sri Lanka and most of the waste that is collected ends up in the ocean or mountains of garbage near poor residencies. Now this is really shocking because recently um, after a heavy rainfall a 300 foot high garbage disposal site. Now it is very hard to imagine this 300 foot high garbage disposal site but it's really um, it's it's really really crazy. Um, and it overflowed, uh, creating a garbage landslide which killed 19 people and destroying nearby, destroying a nearby village. Um, so Sri Lanka is uh, literally drowning in its own garbage. Um, and then we've got the lack of knowledge, which, uh, like I said before, is a major issue, uh, especially in poor coastal communities. Um, Sri Lanka's fishing industry is also suffering heavily under illegal fishing methods. Uh, which cause more damage to the environment. And this is also something that um, I want to focus a lot on is um, supporting these local communities, these fishing industries, and seeing how we can better their lives, how, how we can make their lives better. And it works really well because I'm anyway in touch with the, with the fishermen. I'm buying the fishing nets from them. I'm communicating with them. And it just it's it's just great to have this this um, relationship with the fishermen, and they're sort of like they could potentially become the shepherds of the ocean, because everything basically goes through them. So um, then the irrefutable evidence uh, also indicates a possible environmental disaster for Sri Lanka, uh, for Sri Lanka's marine ecosystems, the safeguard of Sri Lanka's livelihoods, and tourism. So a lot happening there um, in Sri Lanka. So the project, uh, like I said, is just in its beginning phases. And, um, and I'm currently looking for funding for the project to kickstart it. Um, the purchasing of the nets from fishermen, like I mentioned, uh, creates a second income to the poorer communities while educating on waste management. Um, this also again prevents the farmers from using the nets um, as I will hope to be buying all of the nets from the fishermen so that the so that the farmers will go back to using um, natural methods of, um, of, of, of fencing and preventing animals to um, interrogate their crop. Uh, then hand out booklets uh, explaining um, the importance of waste management so this means um, as I said um, during my collection of the nets or I'll also have um, people in the future who do the collecting for me who basically communicate with the fishermen and um, it's just a matter of having a really small educational booklet with pictures in all the languages in Sri Lanka which is Sinhalese, Tamil uh, and English um, and explaining very simply, um, simply enough for a child to understand but also for an adult, um, simply explaining you know just the how how plastic waste basically harms the entire environment and harms their livelihoods as well um, and then of course uh, it'll also motivate the uh, collection of discarded nets so um, one of the methods as well is to um, is to come out with a newspaper article in the local newspaper um, saying that these nets are um, that you basically it's like it, it's like old nets for cash. Um, so this, this, this will go all around Sri Lanka and fishermen will start to um, collect the fishing nets. And I mean, most of the fishing towns and every little fisherman has at the back of their house has a whole mountain of used fishing nets. Um, now this will make them sort of, you know, this will motivate them and be like, okay, great. Finally, there's someone who can just come pick up my nets uh, and I even get money for it. I mean, you know, so, so that's a very, uh, that'll be a very effective method. So the word will start to spread eventually that there is this guy, um, this crazy foreigner um, who's buying all our used fishing nets. Um, and then um, other collection methods, uh, I've got organized beach cleanups, um, which, is, which is already happening in Sri Lanka. There's a lot of government organizations that are doing the cleanups um, and they are collecting large amounts of uh, fishing nets. So it's a matter of getting in touch with these organizations and telling them, look, everything you collect, please keep it aside. I will come, I'll pick it up and it'll be recycled. It'll be sent to recycling and you can even, you know, you can even take the credit for it. You know, say that you've recycled this amount of um, 
fishing nets. Um, then, as I said, identifying the ghost gear through diving centers. Um, this is this is a, a big project as well. Um, also, more like likely to be like a second stage uh, project. Um, but recently, actually on Facebook, I I saw that one uh, that there's a group uh, who are basically who recently organized uh, probably the first um, like dive to identify. Uh, fishing nets and plastic waste underwater. So things are things are starting to move on uh, very very quickly in a very positive way here. Uh, the number four uh, local newspaper adverts, like I mentioned before, um, cash for old nets. Uh, this will this will really excite a lot of people. Um, and then the second phase will be, of course, the recycling of the nets. Um, so sending the waste material to uh, some of the leading recycling factories which I have been in touch with already, uh, such as Aquafil, Econil, Plastics and Retrol. Um, and the most commonly used nylon fishing nets, uh, which I have recently tested uh, in Sri Lanka, are of the highest quality nylon sticks grade. Um, so this is this is very this is very positive as because the the, um, the big factories as like Nik, uh, Econil and Aquafil Plastics Retrol um, are looking for that kind of high quality nylon. So um, out of the seven different types of fishing nets that I have managed to collect, all of them are nylon six. So Sri Lanka is using very, very high quality um, fishing nets. So everything can be, um, can be turned into high quality uh, thread or carpeting or any other um, recycled material. Um, then another big thing is expand. Uh, I am very keen on uh, turning this into a much bigger project. Um, like I mentioned uh, before in other countries and also eventually, um, eventually finding investment uh, to build uh, maybe one of Sri Lanka, maybe uh, Sri Lanka's first uh, nylon recycling factories. Um, collecting a lot of the fishing nets uh, around the Indian Ocean and turning, making Sri Lanka, um, making, turning Sri Lanka into a recycling factory for, um, for the discarded fishing nets. Um, and uh, also expanding the, the model in other areas in Sri Lanka and other countries, like I said. Um, I'm at the moment, I'm focusing on the southern region of Sri Lanka. Um, I'm I'm next week or in, in, in two weeks, I'll be heading to the East Coast uh, and I will be um, trying to identify the situation in the East Coast. Um, the biggest fishing industry in Sri Lanka is the South Coast. So um, that's where I'm usually based. So I'm in a good place to, um, it's a good place to start this project. Um, then implement in other countries, like I said. And after the expanding as well, there's giving back. Uh, this is something that I, I, I'm, I'm very, very, um, very keen on doing is, is setting up sort of this whole cycle um, where funding comes through um, and, and the money goes back into, this, into supporting local communities and also supporting other NGOs, uh, improving the environment and the livelihoods of others. Um, on, on the left here, I also mentioned the source where I have, um, where I got all these, all these details and uh, all the statistics. Um, I've been in touch with uh, with most of these, uh, mo most of these uh, organizations. That's pretty much it. Um, and just wanted to say, uh, you know, the key to a healthier planet lies in the hands of humanity. So um, this is really something that that. Um, that I really believe in, and I think it's 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 just the right time now, and I feel like it's really really up to us um, to make the change because no one else, you know, there's it's only up to us now to clean up our own mess, and I think we owe that to the world. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Leander. I think it's really important to get an idea of what's actually happening in um, regions of the world, uh, such as Sri Lanka, which perhaps don't get as much uh, mainstream attention. So um, seeing that the problem is definitely one there is something that, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping that we can help you with this project moving forward, um, as you know. So um, does anybody have any questions for Leandro? No? 
Okay, well, we'll certainly keep you up to date with how things progress there. And um, I just wanted to, to thank you all again for attending. Um, I know we went a little bit over time, but we did start a little bit late as well. Um, I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions for any of the presenters, please let me know. I'll do my best to get you an answer or put you in touch if possible. And uh, with that, I hope you enjoy, all enjoyed the webinar. Um, I'll let everyone know when it's available online. And uh, thank you all again for joining. We'll see you on the next one, which will be at some point this summer.